The outline for my presentation is shown in this slide. We'll start with a review of important background information on primary ALDO so that we all have the same understanding of what we're talking about. Um, then I'll move on to some challenges faced by clinicians in practice, common questions that clinicians have. And then I'll conclude with an example of a, a recent challenging case uh, that I saw in the clinic. So let's start with that background information. Primary aldosteronism is the adrenal hypersecretion of aldosterone, independent of renin. So patients present with high blood pressure, high aldosterone levels, and low plasma renin activity levels or plasma renin concentration. Two most common causes, what Jerome Kahn described in 1855, aldosterone producing adenoma, or bilateral idiopathic hyperaldosteronism, which I'll refer to as IHA. So why is primary aldo important for the clinician? Two main reasons. First, it's the most common cause of secondary hypertension. Five to 10% of all people with high blood pressure have this disorder. It's incredibly common. And this diagnosis provides you, the clinician, with unique opportunity in medicine. And that is to either cure high blood pressure or provide targeted pharmacotherapy to prevent end-stage primary ALDO, which is renal failure and cardiac disease. The major problem in the world of primary ALDO is under diagnosis. I'm gonna briefly review two articles that address the underdiagnosis of this disorder. The first one published earlier this year from Stanford uh, looked at the screening rate for primary ALDO in patients with resistant hypertension. In the Stanford Health System, they had 145,000 patients with hypertension. Uh, once they excluded CHF and CKD, they had 104,000 patients. Then they looked for what proportion of them have resistant hypertension. Resistant hypertension defined as three drugs, poor control, um, and one of those drugs should be a diuretic, or anyone with hypertension on four antihypertensive drugs. So they had 4,660 patients with resistant hypertension. Then they asked, well, how many of them were tested for PA? 2.1%. Only 2.1% of patients with resistant hypertension were tested for PA. Primary ALDO affects 20% of people with resistant hypertension, but it's in the Stanford Health System, they're not being tested. The patients that were screened in general were younger, had higher blood pressure, lower potassium, and lower rates of treatment with diuretics. So here's a screenshot of the uh, primary ALDO guidelines from the Endocrine Society, and where we tried to focus on the high-risk subgroups for primary ALDO. Uh, so those people with hypertension resistant to conventional antihypertensive drugs uh, on three or more uh, antihypertensive drugs with poor control or on four antihypertensive drugs. What we said in the guideline, all these people should be tested for primary ALDO. However, at the Stanford Health System, only 2.1% were actually screened. Are we doing any better at testing for primary ALDO in patients with hypertension, hypokalemia, or hypertension and sleep apnea? Two other subgroups that we highlighted at the guidelines. This is answered in this article from the University of Chicago, where they had 116,000 people with high blood pressure 36,000 uh, had hypokalemia, but only 2.7% were screened for PA. And they had 5,000 patients with hypertension and sleep apnea, and only 3% were screened for PA. The key message here is this. Only 3% of people with high blood pressure were at the highest risk for PA, resistant hypertension, hypokalemia, are tested for it. The people without resistant hypertension or hypokalemia, the prevalence of testing is even lower. So the reasons for this 
predicament. The false worry about the need to stop blood pressure meds before testing for PA, I think, is the central problem. And the lack of provider awareness that PA affects at least one out of 10 people with high blood pressure. I think those are the two issues. So this is an algorithm I published last year. I started off when to consider testing for PA. And here's a screenshot from that article. I said, over more than three decades, it's been frustrating to see patients who are not tested for PA when they're first diagnosed with hypertension, but rather only after they developed irreversible stage four or five CKD. Clinical practice guidelines have not been effective in driving more clinicians to consider case detection testing for PA. Could the guidelines be too complicated with regard to rules on medications and by focusing on those subsets, the high-risk subsets? The diagnostic algorithm should be simplified and all patients with hypertension should be recommended for case detection for PA at least once. So the algorithm reads, all patients with hypertension should be tested at least once. Don't worry about the high-risk subsets. Everyone with high blood pressure should be tested. How do you do it? It couldn't be more simple. A morning blood test, it's important it's in the morning. There's a diurnal variation in aldosterone and patients with aldosterone produce natinomas. And if you did a four o'clock blood test, the aldosterone level in the blood may not be high. So a morning blood sample, ambulant patient, they sit down and have venipuncture, no special posture stimulation, no special diet, they can be on any medication. You measure aldosterone, you measure renin. It can't be more simple than that. If aldosterone is generous, it doesn't have to be abnormal. I use a cutoff of 10 nanogram per DL. And if the renin is low, for PRA, I use less than one. For PRC, below the lower limit of the reference range, that's inappropriate. Aldosterone appears to be produced autonomously. Then if spontaneous hypokalemia is absent, we need to confirm PA with a confirmatory test. The one we use at Mayo Clinic is the 24-hour urine for aldosterone sodium on a generous sodium diet. Only 30% of people with PA are hypokalemic. So you can't just look for hypokalemia. All people with hypertension are candidates for this disorder. And the patient can be on any sodium diet, any blood pressure medication, including spironolactone, and a plerinone. I'm going to come back to that a little bit later when we discuss one of the questions from a clinician. Confirmatory testing is not needed if the patient has spontaneous hypokalemia and ALDO over 20 and renin is suppressed. It, there can be nothing else that causes that scenario. The four case detection tests, the two liter saline infusion, the captopril stimulation test, fludrocortisone suppression test, or what we use at Mayo Clinic, the oral sodium loading test. In a patient with undetectable renin, when the 24-hour urine sodium is greater than 200, that person's volume expanded. There's no reason to make aldosterone. There's no reason to make renin. Aldosterone in the 24-hour urine should be low, typically less than 12 micrograms. If it's higher than 12 micrograms with that high urinary sodium, that proves PA in that patient with low renin. Once we've confirmed primary ALDO, then we need to determine does the patient have unilateral or bilateral disease. Unilateral adrenalectomy in a patient with an aldosterone producing adenoma normalizes the hypokalemia in all patients, improves hypertension in at least 90% of patients, and cures hypertension in 40%. In patients with bilateral idiopathic hyperplasia, unilateral adrenalectomy doesn't cure the disorder. Bilateral adrenalectomy cures it, but we don't think that's a good trait because now the patient has primary adrenal insufficiency. So these patients should be treated medically with an MR antagonist. So if a patient wants to pursue the surgical option, we need an accurate way to distinguish between unilateral adrenal disease and bilateral. We start with a adrenal dedicated abdominal CT scan. <clears throat> if we find a solitary hypodense unilateral macroadenoma 
greater than a centimeter, so we know it's a real nodule, but not too big. Aldosterone producing tumors are not very large. And if the contralateral adrenal is absolutely normal, and if the patient is young, less than age 35, the development of adrenal nodules in the population is related to age. So the chance of finding a non-functional nodule in someone less than 35 is rare. And if the patient has rip-roaring PA, a plasma aldo over 30, spontaneous hypokalemia, in that unique setting, it's okay to go straight to adrenalectomy. However, <clears throat> at least 95% of people with PA are older than 35 or their CT is non-localizing. In those cases, if the patient wants to pursue surgery, we need to do adrenal vein sampling. So I'd like to move on to some challenging clinical scenarios that clinicians have raised to me. Uh, this is actually my uh, uh, screenshot from my Outlook uh, folder on what I've turned email consults shown on the left side of the screen here. Um, and you can see some of the titles, scuba diving and pheo, hyperaldosteronism, 24-hour urine. Um, so each time I get one of these questions, I put it in this folder. So I've collected 8,870 email consults that I've responded to over the years. And we're gonna search these for questions about PA. So here's one from a couple years ago, uh, August, 2018, uh, subject line, primary hyperaldo. I was wondering if you could help with a case of likely PA. He's a 66 year old male, came with diagnosis of hyperaldo, supposedly diagnosed in 2008, so 10 years before this email. Previous labs from months ago show an aldo of 22.7, that's in nanogram per DL, and a suppressed renin and hypokalemia. At that time, he was off aldactone for two and a half months and off potassium for a week. So this patient has spontaneous hypokalemia. CT abdomen showed a 1.7 by one centimeter adrenal mass on the right. Patient liked to go for surgery if possible because he finds it hard to take all the potassium pills. Would it be appropriate to send him straight to adrenal vein sampling now, or should I do a salt loading and then check 24-hour urine? If I do need to do salt loading, do you have any advice how to do it effectively and monitor potassium appropriately during this time? This actually is a common clinical question. And as you all recognize, doing a salt loading test in a patient with a potassium of 2.7 actually carries significant risk, including triggering cardiac arrhythmias. Um, a separate section, this was a longer email, but a separate section of the email listed the medications. Um, so 60 milligrams of potassium a day, uh, 200 milligrams with toprol a day, 10 milligrams amlodipine, 20 milligrams enalapril, four milligrams doxazosin, and then clonidine as needed. So I wrote back, this is PA, it can be nothing else. Formal Confirmatory testing is not needed. He should have a right-sided aldosterone producing adenoma. I mean, this, this patient has severe hyperaldo, which takes a, in typically a bigger factory. So many times you can see it on the CT scan. But he's over age 35. So I would prove it with adrenal vein sampling before proceeding to surgery. Hope these thoughts help. So. This is basically highlighting this part of the Endocrine Society guideline. Uh, in 2016, we published the revised guidelines. It had been previously published in 2008. And one of the uh, modifications is shown right here, which is a bypass of confirmatory testing. If the patient has spontaneous hypokalemia, aldo's over 20, and renin suppressed, there's nothing you can write on the chalkboard in a list of differential diagnoses. It has to be primary aldosteronism. So in these patients, no confirmatory testing is needed, which is what uh, I addressed in that email. 
So remember, I got that email in the summer of 2018. I, I wrote this physician back in, again in March of 2019, following up on the case from last summer. Did he go to adrenal vein sampling? Did he have surgery? Response, yes, AVS was positive and he was cured. Thank you for your help. So the pearl here is there's just one pearl and it's a pretty simple one. Formal confirmatory testing for primary ALDO is not needed in a hypertensive patient who has spontaneous hypokalemia and ALDO over 20, suppressed renin. It can be nothing else. Okay, let's go on to a, another email question. This is from last month. And the title line is Aldosterone 300. Upper amount of normal in, the, in uh, conventional units uh, at most labs is around 20 nanogram per DL. 55-year-old woman with Gardner syndrome, status post colectomy, 1984, with ileostomy. New onset hypertension last year, easy to control, mild hypertension. No history of hypokalemia. On uh, no meds for blood pressure, only med uh, as a proton pump inhibitor. Initial ALDO, 327. Renin, 12.7. Sodium, 127. Potassium, 5.2. Repeat ALDO, 218. Renin, 8. Potassium, 4.2. Comes to me, blood pressure, 138 over 88. Re review shows old CT from 2018. Mentions a stable right adrenal nodule. We'll do another workup for adrenal adenoloma. What should I be concerned about with an aldo that is high with non-suppressed renin. I'm guessing not primary hyperaldo as the aldo that that high imagine potassium would be low and renin should be at least low. Do you think that just from fluid losses from ileostomy or any workup I should do? This is my response. Suma, you're spot on. This is secondary hyperaldo due to the ileostomy. The way I think about aldosterone and renin, now this, this graphic applies to only those people with hypertension and hypokalemia. And frequently ileostomia patients have hypokalemia too. This one didn't. So in the setting hypertension and hypokalemia, you measure a morning blood test for renin and aldosterone. If renin's high, and aldosterone's high, typically the ratio between aldo and renin is about 10 to one. Then we should investigate causes of secondary hyperaldosteronism. Whereas if renin is low and aldosterone's inappropriate, greater than 10, that's when we should investigate primary aldo. Whereas if renin's low and aldosterone's low in that person with hypertension, hypokalemia, we should be thinking about alternate activation of the mineral corticoid receptor or the MR has been bypassed by some condition. When I think about secondary hyperaldosteronism, I think about renovascular hypertension, diuretics, renin secreting tumor, malignant phase hypertension, coarctation, or marked sodium loss states, which is the basis of this email question. And ileostomy is the classic example. And for reasons I don't know, almost every ileostomy patient is like the one in that email. Normal relationship between aldo and renin is 10 to one. So most ileostomy patients will have a aldosterone of 200 or 300, but instead of a, a renin of 20 or 30 to maintain that 10 to one, the renin, although high, is not is high and the relationship usually isn't 10 to one. I, I think it's because of the chronic elevated renin, it makes the sodium glomerulosa hypersensitive to angiotensin two, and it just doesn't take as much renin to generate as much aldosterone. But that's, that's just a hypothesis I have. Over on the right side, in, um, that patient with hypertension, hypokalemia, but aldosterone's low and renin's low, something else is activating the MR. It can be congenital adrenal hyperplasia, 17 block, 11 block, uh, exogenous mineralocorticoid treatment, 
a doke producing tumor, Cushing syndrome, where cortisol activates the MR, and these typically with severe Cushing's, um, 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase deficiency, either inherited, which is very rare, uh, more commonly it's induced with licorice, which blocks 11 beta HSD, um, or little syndrome, which totally bypasses the, the MR. So that's how I think about hypertension and, and hypokalemia. The pearls here, the highest levels of aldosterone found in humans are not due to primary aldo. The highest aldo levels I've seen in clinical practice occur in people with idiopathic edema. The slang term for these patients are swellers. These are individuals who are very sensitive to sodium intake, typically premenopausal women, but occasionally in men. Um, so they learn the sodium content of everything in the grocery store, and they are on the lowest sodium diets on the planet. If you do a 24-hour urine sodium in a patient with any pack of edema, their urine sodium might be less than 10 millicolons, 10 millimoles. And because of that, they have severe secondary hyperaldo. They usually don't have hypertension, but to maintain and try to defend volume, they make massive amounts of remen, massive amounts of aldosterone. The ileostomy case, these patients have very high aldosterone levels. And if you have an adrenal cancer, make an aldosterone, which obviously is very rare. Those are the three scenarios. Okay, let's go on to uh, another one. Um, the subject line, this was from last month, subject line is 24-hour urine aldosterone diet. Just a quick question. When doing the 24-hour urine aldosterone, do you have to be on a particular sodium diet? Question, milligrams per day. I wrote back, Cheryl, 5,000 milligrams of sodium per day. See attached. So what I attached to this uh, was our uh, primary aldosteronism patient education um, guide, uh, which I'm showing here. And there's a lot of information in here about uh, uh, that, you know, use of CT scan and adrenal vein sampling and surgery and so on. But we have a section on um, confirmatory testing. And it, uh, it reads here, one of the tests used to diagnose PA 24 hour urine collection, you'll be given a container, asked to collect urine for 24 hours. In order for the results to be accurate, you'll be asked to follow a special diet for three days before the test, for three days before the test. And during the day you collect your urine, you must take at least 5,000 milligrams of sodium per day. And then we tell them how to do it. We give them choices for eating out, choices for eating at home. And these are all the sodium contents of all these pretty standard food sources. And then we have several pages where they can add up the milligrams of sodium they had at breakfast, lunch, and dinner so that they can reach 5,000 milligrams of sodium. Now in the United States, to be honest, this is really easy to do. Um, I'm highlighting on the bottom left, um, this is Kentucky fried chicken, right? Um, so if you just have their uh, fried chicken meal, including mashed potatoes, gravy, biscuit, and green beans, that's 2,400 milligrams of sodium. That's half of what you need in a whole day. Um, so going to fast food restaurants in the U.S. is an easy way to do this. Um, and KFC is in every state in the United States and almost every city in the United States. Occasionally, we have patients who... Uh, just can't tolerate these types of foods. In other words, they've been doing a good job with a low sodium diet and they look at this list and they say, I can't do that. We give them sodium chloride tabs, one gram sodium chloride tabs, two tabs, three times a day with food. It has to be given with food. If you can do it on an empty stomach, it causes nausea. Um, and that'll give them about uh, 2,500 milligrams of sodium. So it gets them halfway there. So the, the pearls with regard to this email case, uh, 24 hour urine aldosterone excretion is, I, I'm convinced, is more accurate than a single plasma aldosterone concentration. So I frequently do the 24 hour urine approach, even at the same time I'm doing case detection testing with that aldosterone and renin. Talk with the patient about the diet, what they're eating. Uh, many times, at least in the US, we'll discover 
they're on a high sodium diet every day of their life that occurs, especially in those who are overweight. Um, and in these people, I don't need to salt load them. I just go ahead and do a 24 hour urine on their current sodium intake because it is over 200 millimoles per day. 24 hour urines, we measure aldosterone, sodium and creatinine. Okay, next question. Um, this is from last month, quick question. I have a 55 year old patient with primary hyperaldo ordering the CT and venous sampling. His BP is still 170 to 180 over 90 to 100 on four drugs. The literature I have read suggests I should wait to start spironolactone until after venous sampling. Is that what you would do? Carol, okay to add spironolactone 50 milligrams daily. The only issue for AVS becomes if he's on a high enough dose to completely block the MR. Then renin rises and it could invalidate adrenal vein sampling because if renin is high enough, it potentially could tell the contralateral adrenal to the APA to make enough aldosterone so that you no longer have a gradient in aldosterone from the side with the APA. So back to the email, I said, simply measure PRA the week before AVS. And if it's less than three, it doesn't have to be completely suppressed. It just can't be high. If it's less than three, you're good to go. So this is uh, something that I share in most of my talks when I give on primary aldo. It's something I share in my chapter in Up to Date, which is a commonly used resource in the United States. Um, by residents, fellows, and clinicians. Um, so this is just a screenshot from up to date. Mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, it may be difficult to interpret data obtained from patients on MRAs, spironolactone, or plurino. These drugs prevent ALDO from activating the receptor, resulting in sequentially sodium loss, a decrease in plasma volume, and elevation in renin, and will reduce the utility of the aldo-renin ratio. For this reason, spironolactone and aplerinone should not be initiated until the evaluation is completed and final decisions about treatment are made. However, there are exceptions to this rule. For example, if the patient is hypokalemic despite treatment with spironolactone or aplerinone, then the MR is not fully blocked and renin should be suppressed in such a patient with PA. In addition, most patients with PA who are treated with MRAs are given sub-therapeutic doses. Thus, aldo and renin should be measured in patients treated with spironolactone or plurinone. And if renin is suppressed, these meds are not interfering. Thus, if renin is suppressed, case detection testing, confirmatory testing, and AVS can be performed without stopping the MRAs. So this is simply understanding physiology. Spironolactone and plurinone do not interfere directly with the measurement of aldosterone. It's physiology. If renin is suppressed in a patient taking spironolactone or plurinone or any drug, ACE inhibitor, ARB, loop diuretic, you can do case detection testing for confirmatory testing and adrenal vein sampling. So the pearls here, if a patient is on spironolactone or plurinone and you want to test for PA, my goodness, test. Measure aldo and arena. If arena is suppressed, that spironolactone and plurinone are not interfering and you can do any test you want. Case detection testing, confirmatory testing and AVS. In that, my response to that email question, I suggested starting 50 milligrams of spironolactone a day. In a patient with primary aldo, usually that's gonna be a sub-therapeutic dose. It will help with making blood pressure better. It will help with the hypokalemia, but it will not fully block the MR. And again, what I'm trying to hammer on here is it's this false worry about the need to stop blood pressure meds that I think is the barrier to clinicians to even testing for PA and why only two to 3% of the highest risk groups 
of people with high blood pressure are ever even tested for primary aldo. Okay, next email case. This is from June of this year. May I ask you questions about a case of high primary hyperaldo? Um, my patient is a 67 year old man with hypertension, hypokalemia, and stage four CKD. He's on hydrolyzine, metoprolol, clonidine, and his blood pressure is around 127 over 70s. His most recent creatinine is 3.45. So a normal creatinine would be less than 1.2. This, this patient has stage four to five CKD. Aldo is 89, renin is suppressed. Potassium is 3.5 and he's taking 60 millicoins of potassium a day. That's remarkable. Here's a patient with stage four, five CKD and he's hypokalemic. That's remarkable. Um, I think he has primer hyperaldo. The question is, what is the next step? And what image can I use for him given his creatinine 3.45 and he is not on dialysis? What I told Amy, no doubt this is rip roaring PA that should be caused by an aldosterone prusinadenoma. Non contrast CT is the way to go. The bigger issue is treatment. If he wants to pursue the surgical option, we'll need adrenal vein sampling which can be done if volume replete and the contrast is limited. However, this patient is hyperfiltrating due to the marked PA and the serum creatinine looks better than it really is. When you provide appropriate treatment, whether an MRA or adrenalectomy, the creatinine will rise to the mid fours. Any way you slice it, this patient has dialysis in its near future. So the pearls here, PA is toxic to the kidney, leading to progressive CKD and end-stage renal disease. All patients with PA are hyperfiltrating. The serum creatinine looks better than it really is. The degree of underlying CKD is mass. This has been proven in multiple studies. I've uh, included a couple references at the bottom of this slide. With effective treatment of PA, hyperfiltration will be resolved and serum creatinine will rise. Okay, uh, here's an email from a couple weeks ago. Advice on combined Cushing's disease. I'm sorry, this is actually two years ago. Uh, combined Cushing's disease and primer hyperaldo. I have a 57 year old female past medical history of type two diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, right adrenal nodule 2.5 by 2.1 CM. We evaluated for adrenal mass and is positive for both Cushing's disease and primer hyperaldo. Her screening plasma aldo concentration is 21, renin is low, 24 hour urine aldo is greater than 12 with a urine sodium greater than 200, one milligram overnight Dex suppression tests showed a next day cortisol of 7.4. Normal would be less than 1.8 micrograms per deciliter. 24 year old cortisol is elevated at 15.2 micrograms, cut off less than 45, and the baseline ACTH is less than five. So I, so I think this clinician um, is inappropriately using the, the term Cushing's disease. When we use the term Cushing's disease, we're referring to pituitary dependent Cushing's. Uh, I think this clinician meant to say Cushing syndrome. Uh, so the patient has Cushing syndrome that's not ACTH dependent. Uh, my question is, should we do adrenal vein sampling for laterality of hi primer hyperaldo or just proceed with right adrenalectomy as the hypercortisolism can cause misinterpretation of vein sampling results? Please let me know if you have run into this issue before and what your recommendation would be. So I responded. Um, I said, aldosterone prusinatomas can be tiny and invisible on CT, whereas clinically important cortisol secreting adenomas require a big factory 
and almost all are greater than two centimeters in diameter. So in the setting of concurrent Cushing's, subclinical Cushing's and primary aldo, I never do AVS if there's a unilateral 2.5 centimeter nodule. It can only be that nodule. I take out the adrenal with the 2.5 centimeter nodule. Could this patient have a contralateral uh, APA? Sure, anything's possible. However, it's highly probable that it is a co-secreting nodule. Anyway, even if the patient has a contralateral APA, I do not have a good long-term medical option for Cushing syndrome. That's always a surgical diagnosis. But I do have an excellent medical option for primary aldo. Hope this all makes sense. So that was in July of 2018. I wrote this clinician back in March of 2019. I said, following up on this patient from last summer, did she have right adrenalectomy and did it cure both the cortisol and aldosterone hypersecretion? Hi, Dr. Young, thanks for following up. Yes, she did have surgery August, 2018 and did well. She still has adrenal insufficiency from suppressed contralateral gland and it's on steroids. Hopefully should recover in the next few months. Hope all is well on your end and thanks again for your help. So the pearls here, Unlike aldosterone producing adenomas, it can be very small and visible on CT. They can be four millimeters. Cortisol secreting adenomas require a big factory, typically more than two centimeters in diameter to cause Cushing syndrome. They can be less than two centimeters and cause subclinical Cushing's. In patients with primary aldo who have cortisol co-secreting adenoma, the nodule should be easily seen on CT. And in the setting of a unilateral macroadenoma, a case can be made for omitting AVS, proceed directly to unilateral laparoscopic adrenalectomy, as I recommended in this case. We don't have a good long-term medical therapy for hypercortisolism, whereas we do for primary aldo. So those were the six email cases I wanted to share. Now I wanna go on to an example of the type of challenge I run into in, in my clinic. Uh, this is a patient I saw last month, 63-year-old man, um, referred for further evaluation of PA. And this is just a screenshot from my clinic note in our electronic medical record. PA was diagnosed in May of this year based on aldos of 20 and 22 nanogram per DL, suppressed renin. 24-hour urine aldosterone excretion was 48 micrograms, sodium 174. Actually, this is a common question I get too. What if on a high sodium diet, we don't quite get to 200? Well, it depends what the aldo is. So if the aldo here was, let's say 13 micrograms and we're 174, I'd probably repeat it on a good high sodium diet. But here, this person is volume expanded at 174. They shouldn't be making much aldo. This person's at 48. So there's no doubt this is inappropriate. I would not repeat a 24 year in this case. He has a 10 year history of hypertension uh, that accelerated the past year. Um, so sometimes these patients have genetic high blood pressure and primary aldo on top of it, which may be what happened here. Currently treated with 40 uh, lisinopril, 10 milligrams amlodipine, 100 metoprolol, 25 hydrochlorothiazide. Blood pressure, not well controlled. Potassium, normal to mildly depressed. And reviewing his outside records, I found a K of 3.5 uh, two weeks ago and 3.6 in May of 2019. In 2014, he has abdominal CT for other reasons and bilateral adrenal nodules were found. 1.9 centimeter on the right, 2.9 centimeters on the left. So larger in the left adrenal. And reportedly they were lipid rich. So this is just from our electronic medical record with his medication list. Um, again, he's on ACE inhibitor, he's on hydrochlorothiazide. Both of these should raise renin. Is his renin high at Mayo Clinic? No, his renin suppressed. Is his aldosterone over 10? Yes, 
is aldosterone is inappropriate. And he already did have confirmatory testing. For 99% of patients with PA, blood pressure medicines do not interfere with case detection testing, confirmatory testing, or adrenal vein sampling. If you get nothing else out of this presentation, please do not stop medications to test, to test for primary aldo. Now, if you tested this patient for primary aldo, let's say plasma reactivity was two, fine. Stop the ACE inhibitor, stop hydrochlorothiazide, replace with alternate drugs, wait about two weeks and retest. But that's rarely needed. Um, so my assessment and plan, I've had a thorough discussion with the patient. He would like to pursue the surgical option to treat his PA if he proves to have single gland disease. We scheduled him for adrenal vein sampling July 16th. Uh, he had been on metformin, so we always stop that when we give a contrast. Um, I used the netter painting to describe adrenal vein sampling. His DHA sulfate was low normal at 47. So I was worried that, remember, he's got bilateral adrenal nodules. Could he have some, he didn't have clinical Cushing's, but could he have subclinical glucocorticoid secretory autonomy? So when I really want to know the answer to that, I don't waste time with a one milligram overnight dex. I give him an eight milligram overnight dex. Everyone, after eight milligrams of dex, should have zero cortisol the next morning. What this is going to tell me is, does he have any autonomous production of cortisol from either of his adrenal nodules? Um, so adrenal vein sampling was going to be on a Thursday. And I scheduled him for a follow-up CT scan on Friday morning. Um, and then he was going to see our surgeon that afternoon and then have surgery the following Monday if he lateralized. So here's that eight milligram overnight tech suppression. So again, everyone should be undetectable. He was 1.6. This is not a lot of autonomy, but there's some autonomy. Either both adrenal nodules or one of them is making a little cortisol autonomously. Not a lot. Not enough so I can see it by looking at the patient on physical exam. So does this subclinical degree of glucocorticoid secretory autonomy interfere with adrenal vein sampling? No. AVS is, if you do AVS with cosentropin, this is a non-issue. Don't overthink it. So we proceed with adrenal vein sampling on July 16th. A, a screenshot from the EMR, and you can see the aldosterone level from the IVC is 30, aldosterone from left adrenal vein is 367, aldosterone from right adrenal vein is 3,665. So it's pretty, pretty obvious that the right adrenal is the culprit, but I'm just going to walk through a couple important points here with you. I, first thing I always ask, was adrenal vein sampling successful? Did our radiologists successfully get in both adrenal veins? So you divide the um, right uh, adrenal aldosterone of 506 by the IVC of 29, and you get a relationship of 17.4. We wanna see the adrenal vein cortisol at least five times higher than in the IVC. And usually it's nowhere near five times. It's like this. It's 17 times higher on the right, 20 times higher on the left. So the answer is yes successfully got in both adrenal veins. Uh, next question, does the patient have unilateral or bilateral disease? So you divide the adrenal vein aldosterone level by the respective cortisol level. So on the left, you divide 367 by 577, and the aldosterone to cortisol ratio is 0.64. And do the same thing on the right, 3,665 divided by 506 is 7.24. So we can see that uh, the gradient is actually quite impressive. In the background, it's just 1.0. Does the patient have unilateral or bilateral disease? Well, you divide that high side by the low side. If it's greater than four to one, the patient has unilateral disease. He's 11.3 to one. So he has a right-sided aldosterone producing adenoma. Which side is making a little bit of autonomous cortisol? I don't know. 
Um, and the last thing I look at, does he have contralateral suppression? So we look at the AC ratio from the non-dominant adrenal and we uh, uh, divide uh, the, uh, by the AC ratio from the IVC. And if that's less than one, it's telling us that non-dominant adrenal is not contributing much aldosterone. So I, I pre-scheduled him for the CT the day after adrenal vein sampling. It turns out he does have bilateral adrenal nodules. I've done circles here so you can see the, uh, this on-enhanced CT. There's no reason to do it with contrast. Um, you can see the on-enhanced CT attenuation. These are lipid rich, 6.3 Hounsfield units on the right, 5.7 on the left. The nodule on the left is larger than the nodule on the right. Remember aldosterone lateralized to the smaller nodule on the right and not the larger nodule on the left. So the question is, what do you do? So I walked through the adrenal vein sampling with the patient. I documented in my note. I said, when correct for dilution, the right adrenal is producing 11.3 fold more aldo than the left. Uh, on that CT, there were actually two nodules in that right adrenal gland. I showed you the bigger one. Um, and that nodule on the left is three centimeters. To cure PA, we're recommending laparoscopic right adrenalectomy. He's okay for surgery. Um, he does have a small amount of glucocorticoid secretory autonomy. I don't know if that's coming from the right or left. It's conceivable he could have some suppression of pituitary CTH secretion after surgery. Therefore, our surgeon will give him hydrocortisone infusion on call to OR. He'll check the cortisol next morning along with post-op alvo. So I see him the day after surgery. Um, he's recovering well. His aldosterone the day after surgery is undetectable, which is what we want to see. Pathology showed a, a normal weight of adrenal glands, four grams. He was 12.49. And there are actually five nodules in that adrenal. Which one was making aldo? We're not sure. Uh, his cortisol level the day after surgery, though, was 23. Uh, so he's making plenty of cortisol on its own. Um, I was prepared to give him short-term prednisone coverage. And we didn't need to. Um, we stopped his lisinopril. Uh, we decreased his uh, amlodipine to five milligrams a day. Uh, we continued the combo pill of lisinopril hydrochlorothiazide. Told him to check blood pressure daily. Uh, we advised getting potassium check once a week for the next four weeks. If his potassium should rise above 5.2, we treat them with short-term fludrocortisone, 0.1 milligram day. It usually takes two or three weeks for the kidneys to wake up, start making renin, to tell the remaining adrenal to make aldosterone. At the bottom here, I note that he does have a residual left adrenal nodule. Reasonable follow, it, clearly it's benign, uh, but to follow it up in one or two years with an ambage and also with DEX suppression testing. So to summarize this, presentation. Um, I started by reviewing important background information on primary aldosteronism um, and moved on to six emails that I've received that um, represent challenges that clinicians face in practice in testing and treating patients who have primary aldosteronism. And finally, I reviewed what I considered a challenging case uh, of my own uh, from last month. Uh, and with that, I'm going to conclude my presentation and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor, for that excellent talk on primary aldosteronism. We have got about five minutes for discussion. Any questions from the audience? I have got a few questions from the audience as well here with me. And when we investigate for primary aldo, is there any difference between uh, uh, elder, aldosterone producing adenoma when you compare with bilateral hyperplasia? Any difference between APA and bilateral hyperplasia? Yes. With regard to presentation and the investigations? OK, sure. So. In general, in general, patients with, with aldosterone producing adenomas have more severe disease. Um, they, the, um, 
more frequently, they have spontaneous hypokalemia. Typically, the plasma aldo would be greater than 20 nanogram per DL. Um, they tend to have more severe hypertension. Whereas patients with um, bilateral hyperplasia tend to have milder disease, uh, less frequent spontaneous hypokalemia, less severe hypertension. The problem is uh, I've seen very mild cases of PA who have a unilateral aldosterone producing adenomas. We see patients with severe PA who have bilateral hyperplasia. So to be honest, you cannot rely on clinical predictors in the office to tell you which patient has an adenoma and which patient has bilateral hyperplasia. Thank you. Uh, when, when you get young patients with uh, hypokalemia, without hypertension, is there any point of investigating for primary aldo? Oh, fantastic question. I, um, and this is a really important yeah, subset really of really patients. Subset of patients. Young, people, young people, their counter-regulatory mechanisms, counter are, mechanisms intact. are intact. So young people with PA due to an aldosterone producing adenoma in their early years can have normal blood pressure, but they'll be hypokalemic. So any young adult, which I would consider less than age, let's say 45, with spontaneous hypokalemia, the first thing I worry about is do they have normal tensive primary aldosteronism? So absolutely, measure morning blood tests for aldosterone and renin. Any more questions from the audience? Yeah, I think with the interest of time, I think uh, uh, I would, I'd like to thank uh, Professor William Yam for that excellent presentation on behalf of the Sri Lanka College of Endocrinologists. Thank you, Professor, for that excellent presentation. And also thank you very much for all of you and all the online participants for this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Bye-bye, everybody. Fulciga is indicated in adults aged 18 years and older with type 2 diabetes mellitus to improve glycemic control as monotherapy. When diet and exercise alone do not provide adequate glycemic control in patients for whom use of metformin is considered inappropriate due to intolerance.
As the body changes with age and health status, so do nutritional needs. Max Vida is a customized nutrition product designed to meet dietary needs of adults. Certified specifies the five signature nutrients aimed at improving the nutritional status in adults. The certified signature nutrients for Max Vida are dual protein, dietary fiber, antioxidants, hemonutrients, and bone nutrients. Let's take a closer look at them and understand their role in improving health. The first certified nutrient in Max Vida is dual protein. Proteins form a major part of the muscles and bones. Max Vida gives you the benefit of two proteins in just one product. Our dual protein is a combination of two types of high quality proteins. Soy protein isolate, supro, and milk protein. Supro is a highly purified form of soy protein that is digested easily by the body. Milk protein, which itself is made up of casein and whey. Whey digests very quickly, giving a fast release in amino acids. It enhances immunity and helps in combating various diseases. Casein digests slowly and gives a slow and steady rise in amino acid levels in blood so that protein formation continues for longer periods of time. The second certified nutrient in Max Vida is dietary fiber. Max Vida provides both forms of dietary fiber, soluble and insoluble, in a 50 50 ratio. Soluble fiber as the name suggests, dissolves in water. It softens stools and even plays a role in reducing cholesterol and controlling blood sugar levels. Insoluble fiber does not dissolve in water. It increases bulk of stools and helps in their easy movement through the digestive system. Together, they regularize bowel movements, tackle constipation or diarrhea, and even help in weight loss. Now, we will move on to the third certified nutrient.